unlike the many honored speakers that are showing up for the rest of the program, uh, I am not an expert. I am just really a guinea pig uh, of the Abraham Accords, and I hope to, to share some of my uh, experiences, and I'd like to leave some time for uh, discussion, because just me talking is meaningless. Um, first, Henry Ford. That was an interesting uh, take. There's a quote that is attributed to him, that if he listened to what the people wanted, he would have tried to create a faster horse, not a car. And, and that is exactly what we're talking about here. It's, it's economic freedom is, is, um, is, is about um, how you chart your way uh, through life and economically. Um, so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of my experience about what's happened, the Abraham Accords, because the differences between Israel and the UAE, where I'm from, um, where I work, although I've also worked four years in Bahrain, three years in, in Saudi, um, are very interesting, and, and a little bit of my personal experiences for, for, for our foreign uh, guests, so you understand how to work with Israelis. This is important, trust me. Um, so, I, uh, my wife's American, and in 2020, um, we were talking about going back to the US. She's from New York. So I call up all my friends, and uh, I say, okay, I want to come back to New York. Two months later, they announced the Abraham Accords. I said, hold everything. I want Tel Aviv. And, and they're like, well, what are you thinking? I said, this is an interesting challenge. You know, I didn't grow up working my way through government, which is what it usually happens in the Gulf. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what I did. Um, and uh, one of my friends, uh, Randy Wynn, he knew this gentleman called uh, Jonathan Medved, who's a CEO and founder of Our Crowd, a VC firm in Israel, uh, put us together. We had a conversation, and he said, this is great, but you need to stay where you are. I said, okay. So we signed August 27th. On the 1st of September of 2020, it went out in the news. It hit the FT, it, hit, it went all over. My friends in the UAE called me up and said, how long have you been talking to these guys? I said, since August 27th. So they said, what, you've been talking to them for a year? They didn't understand. This is the Gulf, right? It takes so long. I said, no, 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 no. It's just a month. They take quick decisions. Um, part of that recruitment process is when, we, when I was speaking to John, I told John, if what you want to do is just come and take money from, from the UAE, I'm the wrong person to do it. And number two, you won't get a cent. And if you actually Google my name, you'll see there's an article that says Israelis thought that, that the uh, roads of uh, the UAE are paved in gold and they were wrong. I'm actually a, a big part of that because that's not how it works. I told John, business is not a zero-sum game. If you cannot f f figure out a win-win situation, you're going to lose. And this has nothing to do with just the Abraham Accords. This is anywhere. If you just try to take, maybe you get lucky, but it's not sustainable. So what have we done? <clears throat> You're probably not going to believe this, uh, but we've actually invested more money in the UAE than we've taken out of the UAE, believe it or not. Why? Um, as I first joined, uh, I, I don't know if you know our crowd. Our crowd is a VC, but has a fintech platform. It has 230,000 uh, accredited investors worldwide and been growing. 
and they wanted to use this data, and we have 350 companies, and they, they, they do all these deals. So there's a lot of data, they wanted to use AI. The problem in Israel is there's a lot of AI talent, but the demand is far greater. So they were looking elsewhere. Where were they looking? Eastern Europe, Poland. And I said, hold on, hold on. Let's think about Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi has great talent access. Why? It's easy to get a visa. It's not like all these other countries where it's difficult to get visas and, and bring people in. It's well known, the whole UAE is well known globally as a great place to live. Personal tax, zero. Let's look at this. And as they say, no good deed goes unpunished, I suddenly became in charge of this. Moving forward, we're about to sign a deal in Abu Dhabi where we are going to have 50 uh, scientists and engineers in AI to develop an AI business, global AI business, it's called the Global Innovation Center, where we as our crowd are going to invest millions of dollars in Abu Dhabi. Why? Israel doesn't need capital. It's drowning in capital. America's economy is much greater. The amount, last year, 25 billion in VC. The year before that, 10 billion. So you can see the growth rate. Now it's about flat, but that's still amazing, right? But what we see here is there's a talent uh, migration openness that, that created a joint opportunity where it made more sense for money to go the other way so it can attract talent from around the world. And that's uh, hopefully going to be signed soon. This better not go public until we sign it. Um, so that's, that's just one example of, 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 uh, of, of how you think outside of the box. Everyone was cynical thinking the UAE is an ATM machine that's just going to send money this way. It doesn't need to. It invests globally, or it has to. Israel doesn't need to look for money. It gets money globally, right? And it's thinking outside of that box. So when, when we talk about, you know, not looking for faster horses, this is the same thing. It's about Get away from what everyone's talking about and think what are the real challenges. I had a great time sitting aside watching all of you talking and getting to know each other. That's the ice-breaking ice moment. You want to build something great? What I really believe is you should start talking about the challenges each of your economies are looking at and the strengths each of your economies have and trying to figure out ways how to do it together. Anyone here ever thought that the UAE could offer a talent access as a value proposition to Israel? Anybody would. And yet that is how we just did the biggest deal that's not government to government in the UAE, okay? I am not from a, for the Bahrainis, I'm from a well-known family, but I, my father is not a businessman. I did not inherit anything. I have always been just looking to do challenging, interesting things, right? People called me when, when I signed up after the Abraham Accords, less than two weeks after the Abraham Accords were signed. Actually, they found out I was negotiating before the Abraham Accords were signed, and I got a call. They said, you realize that's not legal yet, but don't worry, we'll look after you. <laughs> if anyone bothers you, it's okay, this is good. But they, they, they said to me, you're, 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 you're committing career suicide because you're going way out ahead of the curve. 
let's see how things happen. Let's see what, you know, if, if you look me up a little bit, I'm not trying to push myself up, but I'm, I'm just not, I'm not some young kid who's just going out. I, 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 I used to run big things. But I said, no, this is interesting. It's challenging. Okay? You want economic freedom? You need to work hard at it. That's work. That's not just work discipline. There are risks you have to take. But importantly is start asking each other how you can work with each other by looking at, one, uh, what are the challenges each one's facing, each economy, and two, what are the, the potential solutions. Now, I want to go into a few personal things of you, excuse me, Bob, but, but to try to help uh, the two sides. When I first joined uh, our crowd, there's a uh, management committee, it's about 25 people, that I'm supposed to be on. For the first three weeks, my CEO would not let me join. I couldn't understand why. Finally, I had it out with him. He was scared I'd see the Israeli way of talking to each other <laughs> and that I'd quit. So I forced him, fourth week I joined, and he told everybody, nobody start shouting. We don't scare Sabah. <laughs> These Emiratis, they're not shouting type people, whatever. Two minutes into it, John starts shouting. He's the first one to start <laughs> shouting. So he starts shouting at one guy, uh, and, and you know, in my culture, that means that guy has to now submit his, his resignation. I'm like, that's it, it's over. Then that guy starts shouting back. I'm like, oh my God, the police are gonna get called. <laughs> it, it, it was just, and then the funniest thing is that after they closed all of that, they moved on to another subject, and John says, Oh, you, you did a great job. He's like, thank you, John, whatever. So, as an Emirati in the Gulf, and, 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 and you know, the Arabs here know this, you know, you miss a meeting, they might not talk to you for two years. <laughs> here, the shouting starts immediately, but within three minutes, once it's over, it's over. And I think we can both learn from each other <laughs> on, on, on that. I'm still learning how to shout. I haven't figured that out yet. Um, but but the, the funniest thing was in the middle of all, of all of this, John came to his senses and sent me a private chat message saying, please don't quit. But, but, uh, so I, th I think, you know, a, a lot of people talk about these cultural differences, but, but when, you, when, when you talk about this, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have read Kahneman's uh, thi uh, thinking. Uh, f that's us. That's us. And if you can put that together, I keep telling everybody that when you can bring, th the issue is not an Israeli company working with, the, with a Gulf company or an Arab company. It's when Israelis, and, and the Arabs create a company together, that's when we will see things that will take over the world. Okay? How did I get invited by Bob? I'm not a government employee, never was. I'm not from a big uh, trading family. I just took the risk of seeing, here's the Abraham Accords. No one's doing anything about it. I have no competitors, let me go. And there I am. So I invite you to join me there, because there's no one else. Thank you. I'll take any questions now, if, if, if you have them. I'd like to know how you think that actually affects the economy. Have you seen a change in the last 
10, 15 years from the launching of those programs at all today? Yes. <coughs> The, 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 there's been a big push, I w in, in my opinion, over and really strong over the last, I would say, seven years. Before the 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 uh, the plan was there, but they were still learning which KPIs to look at. I think they've now gotten the, those KPIs. We're moving faster, faster, and faster on on on, on those KPIs. Um, and, and the focus is completely on the economy now. Um, and, and what I believe is, is that, you know, uh, there have been some timely things that I don't want to get into, they're political, but, but they start back from actually uh, uh, maybe about <coughs> 10 years ago up to recently that has changed the dynamic the smaller countries, not just in, the, in, in, in our region, but, but around the world, of mm, the big guys don't give us stability. So let's figure out how to do that stability together. So I see far, far more opportunities. I mean, right now, uh, I'm working on a deal between Israel, UAE, and Indonesia. Um, you know, and, and we're, it's amazing. And, and you guys know that the deal between Jordan, Israel, that's, that's funded by the UAE, you know, water one way, energy the other. We're going to see more and more of that as these smaller countries say, hold on, hold on. You know, we can't trust these companies, not th these big countries, not necessarily because they're bad. I'll talk about the US, that's the easiest one. Just every four to eight years, it just changes. And, and you, you, you don't have that. So, so you're seeing more interaction, uh, and, and I think that, that that's actually a very, very good thing. And, 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 and why I've, I've, I've agreed to uh, come speak at, at, at Bob's uh, invitation is because I think this thinking, this philosophy is the way forward, okay? It's a non-political philosophy. Un unfortunately, you know, when you put freedom in the Arab world, then all things break loose. <laughs> but, but the freedom here is economic, not, not about political or, or, or anything uh, like that. And, and, and doing, doing that, I think actually, you know, I know, or I feel, I, I don't know, I, I feel, you know, from what I see in, in, in our countries in the Gulf, that they want to try to promote that, you know, that, that please become independent and, and, and free economically and try to build that. Anyone else? Was it there? What do you estimate are the prospects for peace between Saudi Arabia? In general, we're seeing the Jameel project that more of some Israeli companies have been reviewed under the table. Not under the table. So I, I'll say this. On, on the second day that I was announced, I was on a BBC interview, and the, uh, the journalists talked about peace, the UAE. And I corrected. It's not peace. We were never at war. Saudi was never at war. It's about diplomatic normalization. Now. Uh, Saudi has made clear that full diplomatic normalization needs certain issues that are political that I won't get into, but um, I do not believe that either the Israeli companies or the, the, the Saudis would do anything under the table. It's, it's happening, and, and you can see the move towards that, and, and, and I believe that um, <clears throat> that, that as we see successes happening, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue see, to see more and more uh, across the world, everyone is now really looking forward, forward to it. And wh what we need to try to do is, is look at the, 
uh, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan experiment with, with Isra Israel. They think of it as an experiment as the rest of the world. For us, it's not. I, I know our leadership. Once they've made a decision, that's it, you know, um, is to show them the benefits. And, and you guys are, are, the, are the ones who are going to show them the benefits. I'm just an old fogey who, who gets up and talks and, and, and <laughs> looks good. Yeah. Um, in Israel, there is a lot about a lot of talks about the role of the economic initiative, especially with our Arab countries, as a, an engine to facilitate peace. But as we see in this case, it seems like first it was political and geopolitical and security issues that led to the cooperation, and now the economic initiatives are um, being is used to stabilize the peace and to make it more um, concrete. So do you think that going forward from here, economic uh, means can play a much bigger role in creating the whole momentum, or is it really only come to play in stabilizing the uh, okay. stage? OK. So there's two parts to that. When you talk about the defense and national security part, that's been happening long time ago. When you talk about the economic, <clears throat> from our side, the Abraham Accords is not economic. Okay, economic is one part, but cultural is the second part. You know, we have a lot of Israelis coming to the UAE, for example. We don't have enough U Emiratis coming this way. You want to solve a problem, figure that out. How can we bring them and their families here? Because the ones who do come here, and I include myself as one, I was very surprised when I first came here, how it is, how, how, how it. So we've got to think beyond just economic. We've got to think economic, social, cultural, and so on. Economic, unfortunately, what was spoken about is everyone thought tons of money is coming this way. No, it isn't. If you look at Israel as a percentage of the global GDP, it's tiny. The UAE, as an example, I know the UAE best, invests globally. So guess where most of its money is going? It's going to the US, to China, to, you know. Now, trying to invest here, that's coming. I'm not saying that's not coming. But think about when Vietnam first opened. You know, you didn't even have the cultural issues we've had. But you still have to take a few years to understand who's who, what's what, how do I work there. This idea that suddenly tons of money is going to go is insane. As I said, and, and I'm not trying to promote John Medved, but he's the only one who hired someone who has Emirati experience. Not a single other company has. They have some junior representatives. They have some machers. Uh, so, so <laughs> for the non-Israelis, uh, machers is, is wasit, right? So I remember when I first joined, they said, be careful of the machers. I'm like, hey, are you talking to me in the Emirates? <laughs> we have them from all over the world, you know, we have. So uh, it can't be middlemen. It cannot be middlemen. This idea of someone who used to work in security or that's not, it's you guys. You guys are the links. You guys are what's going to build it. Someone who worked in security, who's going to trust them? No, I'm serious. Who's going to trust them? I mean, I, I hear this back home. You know, next person who comes to me from a VC firm who says he worked at, at Section 8200, I, 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 I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> you know, those are the guys we want out, you know. It's like, why are they telling us this? So, we've got to get away of this thinking that, that because it reinforces the, the negative thinking that the ones who can succeed are the ex-national security, the ex-military, the ex-politicians. No, they can't. If they could, 
succeed, they would have done it a long time ago. You don't get paid in, in, in those three areas, <laughs> right? Um, so you guys, you guys are the ones who have to do it, you know? And it's going to take time. It's going to be challenging. You, do, you know, I, I had this white hair when I was uh, 29 years old, by the way. I'm 52 now, but, but, but I got it at 29 because, you know, that it is. And, and for the Israelis, by the way, you think money falls off the trees? I, I, I have a good pedigree in the, in, 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 in the Gulf, not just the UAE. I will tell you the, f the, the first person who gave me money. I was trying to just raise three million. It was number 149. I had to go through 148 who said no to me. And 149. And it's no different. This is the same anywhere in the world, by the way. You just got to keep pushing. Just take out the idea that it's going to come flowing in. Forget the machers. And, 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 and work together. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest uh, obstacle currently that um, if we would uh, to overcome it, the relationships and specifically the economic relationships between the, the people would be um, on a higher level? Bring more people from the Arab side of the Abraham Accords here. Not just the ones who are doing the business. Bring them, their families, their children. Let them see what this is. Figure that out. You know, if you want, you want a business? Go find a Dubai tourism company and be their partner here in Israel. This is what I keep saying. Let's send innovators from Israel to the Gulf and we'll send the service people from the Gulf here. <laughs> but but, but y y y we've got to figure out more how to bring people here because it's only when you have a personal connection that it works. This whole government to government, that's gonna go forward without us. But to build something, we've gotta figure out how to bring them here, make them feel safe. Not spend two hours in security in an airport. You know, that, 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 that's the way to do it. You know, uh, you know the, if the other way ever happened, when an Israeli came into the UAE and spent two hours in an airport, that immigration officer would be fired instantly. Why? But yeah, but you, yes, but I'm an Emirati. <coughs> Do I not want you to exist? No, of course not. Not every. Um, so you look at the. <laughs> but no, uh, no, I agree with you. I'm not saying the security shouldn't be there, but I'm saying that the security should be smart, yeah. right? One of the students here, a student, two, two up. I'm not talking about. Don't have security. Don't worry. And don't forget, I live 30 minutes by, by boat from somewhere. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, so, but, but what I'm trying to say is, is, is that, you know, we have to help change thinking about who yes, who no. I understand what you're saying. And there are citizens, I get it completely. But there are other citizens, let's think about it a little bit, you know? And the, and the checks can happen, you know, with us, the checks happen before you come. You can do the checks before, you know? But we want to get away from these stories. We want them to come. The more they come, every time they come, they love it. Everyone says, I love it. I love it. Everyone's so nice. I was scared. I was whatever. They love it. Just the airport, not so much. 
but but other than that, the hotels, the you know, I love uh, in Jerusalem. You know the the the, um, the train station. God, I love walking around there. Every, everybody knows immediately I'm I'm Arab, and, and, and they love to talk to me, and, and it, it's great. Um, but but uh, we went too far into that. Really, it's more about making them feel comfortable to come here. I'm, I, I will not talk about security or, or, or anything like that. That should never be compromised, ever. I'm with you on that. But, but let's make them feel that when they come here, okay, and, and talk to, to, to the, the other uh, Arabs who, who have come maybe for the first time, I bet you that their view of what was going to be and, and how it was. I saw all of you guys. I was watching all of you guys and how you welcomed everybody. And it's that kind of thing needs just to be propagated. And that goes to the gentleman in the back when he said, what's the greatest challenge? Let's bring more here. The more you bring here, the easier it is. Because you build personal relationships. Yes. And, and, and I do not want any more political or security questions, please. <laughs> Go ahead. What is so special? What is so special in Israel? Why do you think that uh, there is such a big, big opportunity to do business with Israel? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't asking. <laughs> I wasn't looking for. It's not about what's so special about Israel. It's what's so special about the, the, the what's so complementary about the countries, right? If, and again, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to talk about, I know we have uh, people from, from Bahrain, Morocco here, so I'm not going to talk about that because I, I, I don't work there. I'm just going to talk about the UAE. Okay. In, in, while I was trying to figure out my strategy, I spent 90 days working with, with our crowd. Israeli entrepreneurs are great at ideating new ideas, creating innovation. Their biggest challenge is actually commercializing, right? So what happens? You have an R&D lab. They're all scientists. They've developed something. They, they get it approved, whatever. OK, now they need a chief commercial officer. So they take a scientist, put them, make him make a chief commercial officer. That doesn't work. I'm sorry. You can be smart as you want, but that's not going to work. The biggest export that I've seen, and this is personal experience, from Israel is not uh, innovative businesses. It's actually just IP. IP is getting sold to the West. And there's in, in these big businesses, wh where are they? All the Israeli unicorns, there are some here. Mobilize, the biggest one, right? Yeah. But where, where are they mostly listed? Somewhere else in another country. Now, the UAE has built Global companies. Some people think it's just about throwing money into it. There's lots of countries with, with a lot of oil or other natural resources. They haven't managed to do it. Have you flown Emirates Airlines, anybody? Or Etihad Airlines? Try it. It'll blow your mind. You know, and, and Emirates Airlines is, I use Emirates, not Etihad, because Dubai has no oil. And they built something incredible. Do you know when Emirates Airlines was founded? Someone give me a guess. 70s? 85, 70s, 71 is when, when the UAE was founded. I'm older than my country. But it was 1985. But it became famous in the late 90s. Right? So there's a long-term strategic planning about how to think globally. Bigger than Emirates Airlines is DP World. I don't know if you know DP World. It's, it's uh, Dubai ports. It has ports around the world, uh, 250,000 people. It is the largest manager of US naval ships, uh, uh, largest foreign manager of US naval ships globally. That's how big it is. And they've done that. So how can we work together? We work together by taking the innovation here and taking the commercial thinking there and marrying it. And that's why I said earlier, it's not about money this way, technology that way. It's having about 
people from both economies, businesses working together. Thank you. Yeah. Me? Okay. Um, if you were to look back on your first baby steps into the business world, what, were, what would be some tips you would give someone uh, on the beginning of their business path to uh, uh, improve or help them avoid some of the mistakes you've made, hopefully without losing any of the valuable lessons? Which country? <laughs> and that, that, that really depends. Um, I think one of the most important things is take notes and review. You've got to keep reviewing, right? You know, people talk about passion. If you're not passionate, you're not going to succeed. You know, to me, passion comes after you succeed, not before. Otherwise, you're just a psychopath who's just stuck on a, on a you know, there's nothing wrong with sticking to the same goal, but you've got to keep reviewing your, your, your strategy and your operation rollout, uh, rollout to get to that goal, right? That's, that's, that's extremely, extremely important. Um, I, think, I, think, I think you've got to think about hiring a professional team not friends. Too often what I see is people hire friends, and I get that. You know, but what happens is, within a year or two, if you start getting successful, you're going to have to have that conversation with that friend and say, hey. And that just creates problems. Um, cash control is very important. Like, I, I've been to way too many startups that have a playroom, uh, I don't know what, I think it's just a sun deck, you know, that, that, you know, it's, it's, if, if, if I was part of that board, I'd go nuts. I think, what are you doing? You know, yeah, sure, there's sometimes great times, but, you know, cash flow is all important. Um, so I think those are some of the things. But the most important thing is, is, is personal relationships, right? Be genuine. Don't lie. The number of times someone tells me they have a 12-month runway and it's about 12 days, and I'm not stupid. You know, uh, I'm not a CFO, but, but uh, I can figure out that you don't have a 12-month runway very quickly, you know. And, and so you build those relationships because you're going to fail. If you guys want to do startups, I don't know if you do or not, but if you do, you're going to fail. Bet on it. You know, I've built 12 companies, okay, seven went under so fast, they'll make your head spin. Made my head spin. But, uh, if you build the right relationships, you will keep getting the backing and you build up over time, okay? But in the end, build a team, manage your cash flow like your life, you know, like, you know, like having, you know, free pizza and free whatever, no. Nah. You know, you, you, you explain to your team, I'm keeping this money so that when things go bad, like they are now, I can keep some of you on, you know? uh, and, 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 and the third, manage your relationships. Because when the good luck comes, it'll come because you're a decent person. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to ask, at the end of the day, you wanted to work in New York, said no, I want to work in uh, Tel Aviv, and now uh, you work with a company in Tel Aviv, but in the uh, Emirates. Uh, and you do say that you do have the talent over there. And here, I know everyone is lacking for talent. We're missing thousands and thousands of workers. So basically, what is missing for this equation? We need you. We have the money, as you said, to pay. And that's the business plan. That's my that's my business plan. But it makes your, the companies work. 
So I'll give you an example. There's several companies that were helping out, you know, I'm not in control of immigration policy in Israel, right? You know, that's, you know, one government a year as far as I can tell. <laughs> the, the, and, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the thing is, is, is that you need more operational leverage, not financial leverage. And the Emirates can bring that. Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, you can bring that because we have easy uh, um, uh, labor laws, right? And especially for the type of talent you're talking about. In the UAE, you have a master's or, or a PhD in, in, in a tech area, you get an automatic five-year visa. You're basically treated like a UAE <coughs> national, right? Zero percent tax. So, so when, you, when you're talking about the shortage here, I did not create that shortage. The UAE didn't create that shortage, but we can help support that. Yeah, so the question is, I, I understand the lag here. So we don't have enough yeah. people with the talent coming here. Yeah. And now, so the road is it's easy to go. Get them to come here and take a visa and work. Right? We need the people. Mm, yes, but the, as I understand it, and, and I don't want to get into immigration politics, unless you're from a certain faith, you can't get a visa and come here. So we sit next to 1.5 billion people, a lot of whom are very high tech and who feel very at home in our country because there's a lot of their countrymen there. And that's who we're bringing in. And that's just India. There's, there's from Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, from Russia, from Ukraine, Poland. We have, we have, we have communities and, and they can come. Now, we're not taking away from Israel. It's the immigration policy and I'm, that's not my job to get into it. I'm just trying to say I see how it can complement each other. For the ones who have shortages, when you have shortages, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you know how easy it is to get a work visa in the UAE? It takes three days. Three days, three hundred dollars. And in three days is just because you need to compile the paperwork. The actual presentation is about 15 minutes. Mm, sorry. Uh, you talked about what is going to be in other economies, economic, corporate culture of Israel and China. Israel, in my mind, is still not all the way assimilated as a neighbor, as a new neighbor on the street. I wonder what Israel has learned from the UAE culturally better integrate in this region. And vice versa. Okay, fine, culturally. I I I I I think look I, I, I think traveling to the UAE is interesting. The number of Israelis I've seen being approached by countries that haven't signed an Abraham Accords out of curiosity has been amazing. The issue is just keep an open mind and learn. You know, like starting shouting at the police officer, it's not a good idea. Okay. Um, the, the, but the, 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 the respect that I've seen from, from the hundreds of thousands of tourists has, has been good. You know, uh, there have been some incidents, but that happens with any nationality, whatever. I think, I think the, the basic issue really is about patience, right? 
we don't do quick small deals. And, 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 and that's where there's the main misunderstanding. Everyone wants to do a quick small deal. Uh, 100,000 here, 500,000. You know, my, my boss once asked me to, to raise $200,000. I'm like, I don't know how to raise $200,000. He tell me 200 million, yes, maybe. 200,000, I don't know. 200 million will take me two years, but I'll get there. 200,000, I'll never be able to do. So there has to be this, this idea, and, and now they're getting it. My, my boss is really getting it, my team is getting it. My boss always got it, but my team is getting it. Until January of this year, they're like, ah, why are we spending time with you? We've got America. Just pick up the phone, bam, money comes in. Now that ain't happen, right? And they're beginning to understand to diversify. From a cultural point of view, I've, I don't think the issue is, is, is the Israelis, because they're going and they're learning and, then, and, and, and they're uh, being well behaved. I don't know who's training them to because my, you know, my, some of my friends are like, don't let anyone come below a, a, a three-star hotel. You'll be in trouble. I'm like, okay. But uh, what I think we need is to bring the, the Arabs here. I think that's what, what, what we need. And not businessmen. Like, we need, like, I, what, last time I came, I came with my wife. Now I'm looking at, at getting an apartment in Jerusalem for the summer, because you know how hot it is now in Abu Dhabi? 45 Celsius. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's, so there's, there, there's, so I, I, I think it just takes continued uh, um, uh, travel and visit, and the Israelis are well known for traveling and visit. You know, we've just got to get the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans here. You know, that, that's what we've got. So, okay. Let me ask the last question. Sure. So, I was in Israel and I was saying, I remember in one of the first seminars we did with the Freeburg Economics Institute, an Israeli girl came to me and she said, Bob, you don't understand. You know, the Israelis handle their government. You know, we look to our government as our security. You know, you need to understand that. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder, in your experience in the U.S., the Emirates of Israel, would you be inclined to make any observations of the differences that you see way Israeli citizens and Iraqi citizens, American citizens, thinks about the government in relation to the government? I need like a whole bottle of gin before I answer. <laughs> um, it, look, in, in the Emirates, we have been treated so well by our leadership that where they lead, we follow because we continue be, to be treated well. I think uh, in, 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 in democracy in general, democracy has a balance between power and longevity, right? And they control the power via longevity, by uh, shorting the longevity. The problem with that is what you have, in my opinion, is that you do not have a consistent um, um, policy, whether it be internal or external. When, when people come and say to me, you know, I, I had American delegations come and, you know, they're like, don't you want democracy? Like, why, why, why do I want democracy? Democracy is a means to an end. Look where I live. Paradise. Why do I want to change that? You know, and, 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 and the issue is that why do we have this infrastructure? Because we have a leadership that's there long term, right? This is not a, 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 any kind of attack on, on democracy. I'm just explaining the differences, right? And, and, and I think the biggest issue is that, is that, is that to build long term infrastructure, if, look at how China became where it is. 
it's because they just single-mindedly said, this is where we're going to go and, and, and how we're going to do it. Now, I think there is a, a you know, all citizens uh, love their governments and their leadership to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah, I know you're Israeli, don't start on me. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, 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 you know, for, for me, it's, it, the, the real issue is, I think the real trick is, is how do you put into place for governments that turn over quickly, how do you put into place a 20-year infrastructure program? The, the WEF has ranked the UAE as the number one ICT infrastructure in the world. And how did that happen? Because they planned it. It didn't get stuck in arguments uh, in some parliament and whatever, and municipality and whatever, whatever. They planned it, did it, it's done. Now, I can't speak for the other side because I, I haven't lived it long enough and I haven't been part of it. But I think really, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is, is how do you engender long-term policy, even though there might be change in government. The, the fact that, that policy keeps changing between each government, even if it's four years, eight years, that's the US. Here, four, four months, six months. <laughs> um, the, you know, I think that's, that's the issue, because, because infrastructure, and here I'm, I'm coming from an economic, not a political point of view. But from an economic point of view, to build that infrastructure, like the, the, the biggest thing I said is, you know, go get Dubai to come build two, three palms over here. Build the hotels, give Emirates Airlines rights, run the, and, to, and to also run the airport, and you'll see the tourism go up like 10,000%. And they'll bring the funding from outside. Okay.